three, two, one, we're live. Hello folks, this is Steve, and I'm not in Israel. I'm on the east coast of the United States, in the home where I grew up. Because a few weeks ago, my father unfortunately suffered a, a setback in his health. He fell down multiple times here in the house. Uh, over five weeks, he was hospitalized. He was housed in a rehab facility. And he was finally released home a few days ago as a semi invalid for lack of a better word um, with hope to improve which is why I'm here I'm here to help my 84 year old mom bear the burden of taking care of my dad but also to coach my dad back to uh, mobility and uh, there is hope for that his situation Ian suffered a stroke he basically fell down multiple times because of swelling in his legs uh, related to another issue going on. I don't want to get into all the intimate issues of my dad's health or, or anybody else's health. But uh, I'm here in the United States and I'll be here for several months, uh, which means that I'm not going to be able to make any tour-related videos. I'm not going to be seen at sites over the next couple months. And instead, I'm going to switch gears and do what I'm doing today, which is I'm going to teach a series of teachings. And believe me, it's unlimited the amount of things that I could share with you. These are typically subjects that I share on a tour bus or over dinner or at lunch or in a conference hall at the hotel uh, with tour groups after dinner. Um, to be honest with you, I would say over half the information that I share with any particular tour is not at the tour sites. But in these type of lectures, discussions, uh, like I said, on the bus, the hotel, around the pool, uh, and this first subject I want to speak to you about today was brought up by a friend of mine in Nevada who works in Christian ministry and uh, she told me that she was confronted with this subject and I told her that I myself have been confronted with this subject that I'm about to share with you multiple times as a tour guide. And that is the assertion of many Christians uh, lay people and pastors as well. And by the way, I work almost exclusively as a tour guide with evangelical Christians, mostly from the United States. And there's this common belief or assertion that they'll make that we, the Jews, have failed in our God-given mission. In other words, we fumbled the football 2,000 years ago when we didn't accept Jesus as a Messiah. And they, the Christians, picked up the football and kept on running, and they continue to run with it as God's witnesses, as God's missionaries. And uh, we, the Jews, have basically taken a sabbatical, if you will. Is that assertion true? Um, well, the answer is no, uh, and I'm going to explain to you why, and uh, I think it's going to surprise some people, Jew and Gentile alike. Now, part of the confusion is the Christian orientation towards two words in particular, missions and witnessing. Okay, uh, both of those, of course, entail in the Christian mindset, Christian individuals going about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with their neighbors, with strangers, in other countries as missions, okay? And although they may be backed by organizations, their witness or mission is taking place or being executed proactively on the individual level or basis, okay? And that, that's where the problem really begins. And therefore, in the Christian mindset, with their orientation towards those two words being what I just said, they look at the Jewish people and say, well, gee, what are they doing? Or what, are they, what have they been doing? Um, they project their Christian understanding of those words uh, onto the Jewish mission, which is very different from the Christian mission. In other words, uh, in the popular mind of many Christians, the Jews, we should have been going around our neighborhood in the Middle East a few thousand years ago, knocking on doors, uh, asking, hey, can we talk to you, uh, John Doe or Shlomo Doe, uh, about, Shlomo, by the way, being uh, Hebrew for Solomon, uh, or David, or whatever name you like, can we share with you the good news of Yahweh, the God of Israel? And the charge is that we, the Jews, became this insular or insulated people, uh, inward thinking, not concerned with the rest of the world. 
uh, and therefore we failed in our mission. But you see, this is where the misunderstanding takes place. The Jewish mission to the world has been, is, and always will be. It was meant to be on the collective level as a nation, not on the individual level of individual Jews going around and sharing the news of Yahweh with the world. Um, it takes place on the national level as the God of the Bible, who calls himself the God of Israel hundreds of times. Okay, He's inex inexorably linked with the nation of Israel. From the moment he revealed himself to Abraham and later on to Moses by his proper name Yahweh, okay, the God of Israel, ever since then he is the national deity of the Jewish people, inexorably linked with our history, our present, and our future, okay? And the Jewish witness to the world is how that God, the God of the Jewish people, has related to us throughout all of history. He's the sovereign of Jewish history, in other words. He sovereignly called Abraham to be the very first Hebrew. He sovereignly had the descendants of Abraham sojourn in Egypt. Uh, he sovereignly had uh, the Jewish people, or let's say better, better said the Israelites in those days, okay, were not yet known as Jews, but as Israelites. Uh, just so that you know, a Jewish person, a Jew basically means somebody from the tribe of Judah, okay, and it would be premature for me to use that term uh, in the era of the book of Exodus, okay, so he sovereignly has the Israelites be released. In fact, the Bible says he both softens and hardens Pharaoh's heart towards the same, okay, of releasing the Jewish people. Again, I just erred in my, I just went against my own counsel here, okay, the Israelites to release them to go to the promised land. He sovereignly is uh, working miracles through Joshua and later on through the judges in clearing the land of its original inhabitants, the Canaanites, and settling us there. He then sovereignly removes us from the land following the destruction of the first temple and you could argue the second temple as well. And according to many passages in the Hebrew Bible in particular, he sovereignly is regathering us to Jewish people collectively back to our land in this very day. Okay, and I'm going to read to you a passage, in my opinion, one of the most important passages about this modern day regathering of the Jewish people back to the land of Israel in the book of Ezekiel. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 36. It's through these sovereign acts of God in Jewish history that God is revealing himself to the world. That's the Jewish mission. And believe it or not, it's taking place whether we as Jewish individuals, believe it or not, want to co-opt ourselves in it or not, or participate in it or not, okay? I'll even argue with you that some of the most atheistic, uh, not-so-righteous Jews, people like Jeffrey Epstein, okay, or Bernie Madoff, or, or Harvey Weinstein, okay, these are some of the most infamous Jews of the last couple of years, for those of us from America are familiar with these names. Even those Jews, whether they like it or not, are witnesses uh, witnessing to the existence and the proactiveness of the God of Israel to this very day. After all, he said in the Bible that he would preserve us throughout the ages against all attempts to destroy us, to genocide us, okay? And uh, every Jewish person who exists to this day in this present generation is a testimony, a miracle, bearing evidence of the fact uh, that the God of the Bible, Yahweh, has preserved us until this very day. Whether that Jewish person believes in that or not, whether that Jewish person thinks it's nonsense or not. Okay, that is the biblical world view. Um, now let me go back to the book of Joshua. Okay, I think it's Joshua chapter 3 in a minute. I'll open up to see if it's 2 or 3. And we'll see an early example of this Jewish witness on the collective level. In this case in particular, it was to Rahab the prostitute. I'm going to turn now to the book of Joshua, chapter 2, not 3. Okay, And if you recall, after 40 years of uh, wandering through the wilderness, the Israelites show up on the plains of Moab, Okay, and they encamp their spies are sent to Jericho and they encounter the prostitute Rahab and have this following discussion with her. Okay, and I'm starting from verse 8. Before the men lay down, she, Rahab,
he came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that Yahweh the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and to Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for Yahweh your God, he is God, in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Okay? There it is. Rahab confessing the God of the Jewish people as God without a single Jewish person ever have handed her a track or have knocked on her door like a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. Okay, and I'm mentioning them because they, they more famously do this door-to-door -door type of witnessing. Okay? Without a single Jewish person ever having encountered or crossed the paths with Rahab or a citizen of Jericho, they have been witnessed to, and boy, that were they witnessed to. Okay, the entire population of Jericho had heard of the things that Yahweh, the God of Israel, had done for the Jewish people along that path of 40 years. At least in the case of Rahab, she became a believer. Okay, now that's how God used us, the Jewish people, on a collective level, or in a collective sense, to witness to the world. But I'm telling you that that's still the way he's using us and will continue to use us in the future, okay? And I want to conclude this by going to Ezekiel 36, which I think is one of the most relevant and significant passages in all the Bible as it relates to the days that we live in. Okay, so give me a moment as I turn to Ezekiel 36. And I'm going to read from verse 16. Okay, and this is going to explain the reason why God both threw us out of the land as well as why he's restoring us to the land in this day. And it is spoken in very clear language here. Um, the word of Yahweh came to me, son of man. When the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanliness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land, for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries in accordance with their ways and their deeds. I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, and that people said to them, These are the people of God, and yet they had to go out of his land? But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. That's Ezekiel 36, verse 16 and onward. Wow. Okay, so here for the last 2,000 years, we've been scattered abroad, uh, living in places like Europe, culminating in the Holocaust 70-some years ago. And the nations that were watching all this said, who is this God of the Bible? He can't even protect his own people. And you know what, folks? That cynicism exists among not just the Gentiles, among the Jews themselves. Because my own father, uh, who I'm here protecting and helping and nursing back to, uh, to health, every year around the time of the Jewish holidays, the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, my dad says to me, Steve, what is all this chosen people business even worth? Where did it get us other than being hated by the whole world uh, and being stuffed into Hitler's gas chambers and crematoria? And you know what? There's some truth in what my dad says. And as the world looks at this, and as Jews looked at this, they started to lose their faith in the God of the Bible because the reputation and fame of the God of the Bible is somewhat linked to the ever-changing fortunes of his people, the Jewish people. Okay, when we're knocking down with his help the walls of Jericho, and when we're winning six-day wars, well, he looks great. After all, we all agree that these are miracles. But when that same people, the Jewish people, are being kicked around, uh, and not only killed in the Holocaust, but abused in the most diabolical of ways, okay, um, our hair being used to stuff pillows for Nazi soldiers, for instance, or 
our hair again being used to, uh, for stuffing for children's dolls. Our skin was used to make lampshades, okay? Um, arriving to the lowest point a person can in indignity and in, uh, in dignified treatment, well, it didn't just make us look weak. It makes our God look weak. And therefore, he's saying here that he had jealousy for his own name. And that's why he was about to reverse things dramatically. And he has. He, he's done that since. And now I'm going to pick it up again in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 33. Okay? Again, this is spoken in very plain language. There's nothing, no riddles here. Thus says the Lord God, on that day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled, instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who pass by. And they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am Yahweh. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which is desolate. I am Yahweh. I have spoken and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, This also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them to increase their people like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of people, then they will know that I am the Lord. So two peoples God is aiming at with this revelation, to know that He is God, He is sovereign, He sits on the throne of the universe to this day. The Gentiles who see these things and the Jews who experience these things as we're doing in our day. And by the way, there's hundreds of passages. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. Hundreds of passages in the Hebrew Bible, what we the Jews call the Hebrew Bible, what Christians historically refer to as the Old Testament, they refer to this latter-day regathering of the Jewish people to the land, and it's happening in our very day. Uh, and what's amazing is I meet Christians occasionally uh, who are totally oblivious to this, who think that the rebirth of modern Israel and the regathering of Jewish people from over 105 to 10 countries in the world, literally from the four corners of the earth, as every prophet without exception saw in the Hebrew Bible. Well, that's all just a coincidence. That Israel is no different than any other average country in the world, be it modern-day Greece, modern-day Australia, Russia, okay? In doing so, they... They, they, they treat irresponsibly, like I said, hundreds of passages of the Bible that you either take literally or you don't. But guess what? If you don't take them literally, the burden of proof is on you to tell me why they shouldn't be taken literally, not on me, for looking at the world about me and seeing uh, the great movements of the world today, such as the migration of the Jewish people back to our land. And for me to have to explain that that's just a coincidence, that burden's not on me. For you, if you belong to a school of thought called replacement theology or a church supersessionism that believes that God's finished with the Jews, all because we rejected Jesus 2,000 years ago, it's for you to explain how hundreds of passages are being fulfilled literally in our day, but that they're not really being fulfilled because you reject that and you allegorize them away. Uh, so... Here it is, or here it was, the first of uh, several teachings that I'll be giving over the next few months as I'm here in the United States with my family, nursing my dad back to care. And do me a favor, leave comments or questions in the comments section to each video. And if enough of you watch these videos, I will do question and answer videos as well. In fact, maybe we'll even do these YouTube live videos. Also, always look at the links that I supply beneath each video. Sometimes I'll uh, furbish you with uh, suggestions for further reading. There's also links to my Patreon page and PayPal accounts should you want to adopt this channel, Israel on Foot, uh, and help it to keep going, help me to keep going as an unemployed tour guide, cum YouTuber. Uh, anyway, folks, Thanks for your attention, 
and I look forward to seeing you for the next teaching of Israel on Foot. Until then, I bid you adieu, or shalom. Bye-bye.